Good morning. It was not unusual for people to ask Jesus questions. In fact, they did quite often in Scripture, and it's interesting because many of the questions that were asked was filled with uh, hidden motives and agendas that uh, were probably a whole lot more self-serving than uh, they thought that Jesus would know. But there were also people who asked questions, you know, because they really wanted to get to know Jesus more. And you can see that kind of woven all throughout the New Testament, especially in the Gospels. There was one time when some people came to Philip, of all people, and said, hey, Philip, would you take us to see Jesus? In other words, they wanted to get to meet Jesus and spend some time with him. And I wonder how many times we come into the church, into the house of God, without that sort of motivation. In other words, we didn't necessarily come here to see Jesus. We didn't come here, you know, expecting that God was going to do much in our lives. In fact, to the contrary. We came here with the idea that we're fulfilling a responsibility that we owe to God as Christians. And we just kind of put in our time and we go home hoping that somehow that experience will change our lives. And yet, God wants so much more for us than that. He expects so much more for, from us than that. And you know what's interesting is we kind of treat church much like they did prior to Christ's coming. In other words, we come into the church and we kind of feel like we're in, you know, maybe the outer courts rather than the Holy of Holies. When in fact you've been invited to come into the Holy of Holies to meet Jesus, to spend time with Jesus. It was clear who asked the wrong questions and who asked the right questions. Many of the religious leaders would ask questions like, by what authority do you have to do this? Why don't you tell your disciples to follow our rules? They asked sort of, questions like that that kind of told you where their hearts were. But then there was these great disciples of Jesus who really just wanted to get to know him more. And they asked questions like, Jesus, what must a man do to be saved? How can we know the Father better? Jesus, can you tell us? What's the, the most important thing for us to do? I mean, we're just simple men. We don't have great educations. We got jobs, you know, and we don't trust these religious leaders. So can you kind of just boil it down for us? Help us to understand exactly what it is that we need to do to be made right with you and stay in a right relationship with you. Because, man, I'm going to tell you, listening to these Pharisees, listening to these religious leaders, I'm worn out with it. I really got no clue, should we do this, should we do this? I mean, I'm just scratching my head all the time. And you know, Jesus being the loving Savior that he is, he looks at these disciples and he gets it. He said, listen, this is not going to be a problem. There's one thing you need to do. And if you do this, it'll change your life. So don't get caught up in all the do's and all the don'ts. Don't worry about, you know, fulfilling this law, fulfilling that law. One thing I'm asking of you. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Man, that's it. If you'll do that, if you'll just follow the greatest commandment, I'm going to boil it all down to this. Just love me with everything you've got. And all these other things that you're tripping over all the time, all these other things you're trying to figure out, should we or should we not, it's going to be simplified for you very quickly if you'll just love me with everything you've got. You understand that's what God's saying to you today? It's very simple. Just keep the main thing the main thing. No matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's going on in this world, no matter what struggles you have, what circumstances you're trying to overcome, just keep it simple. 
keep the main thing, the main thing. You love me with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. And I'm telling you right now, I promise you, you'll have the most fulfilled life you could ever imagine. You will never work this up on your own. You're never going to have to worry about, you know, am I following the right rules? Did I do this? Did I cross the right T, dot the right I? Man, just love me with everything you got. Is that simple enough for us? I think it is. There was a, a guy that introduced himself to a total stranger. And he introduced himself as pastor so-and-so, and immediately the guy just stopped him. He says, wait a minute, before you go any further, you need to know I'm an atheist, and I do not believe in God. So the pastor looked at him and said, well, listen, would you mind at least telling me what kind of God it is that you don't believe in? Well, the guy had no problem going through the whole list of reasons why he's an atheist and describing what kind of God he doesn't believe in, so he just let him have it. When he got through with it, the pastor kind of stepped back and he says, wow, I must be an atheist too because I certainly don't believe in that God. That's a true story. I want you to think about that. For the last several weeks, we've been in a series on getting to know God, folks, for that very reason. Getting to know God, because listen, there are so many people who reject God before they ever get to know God. In other words, I've heard so much about him. There's so many rules. There's so many hoops that I've got to jump through. I got no clue I'm I'm, I'm ever going to make this. I mean, I just don't believe I'm ever going to measure up, at least based on the stories I've heard, the rules that I have to follow. I'm never going to make this. And so people... Give up on the idea of faith before they ever enter into it just because of the people of God and because they absolutely have no clue who he is. They've heard about him and they've seen, you know, maybe some of the evidence of God here and there, but imagine these disciples, you know, coming to Philip. You can read about that in John 12. They came to Philip and they said, Sir, can we meet Jesus? We don't want to hear about him anymore. We don't want to see the miracles anymore. We want to see the man. There comes a time in our lives when we got to stop listening to what everybody else has to say about Jesus and go find out for ourselves who this Jesus really is. And that's only going to happen if you have a desire in your heart to know him more. If you have no desire to know any more about who he is than you do right now, then your faith isn't going to change. Your understanding of God isn't going to be any better than it is. But if you love Him, and there's something inside of you that begins to grow, a desire that says, I want to know Him more, it will change your life. I'm telling you right now. You're going to realize, man, I've been working so hard for things that I never had to work for. All I had to do was love Him with everything I have. We've looked at several different attributes of God, and this morning we're going to wrap up this series by looking at the love that God has for us. Now imagine, we heard all of these stories. In fact, there there is more written and more, more talked about when it comes to the love of God than anything else. We've heard all of these things. But when we learn to love Him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, It's at that point that your eyes are open to see how much he truly loves you. And when you understand how much God loves you, that's going to change your perspective of him as well as yourself. In 1 John 4, 16, the Bible says, we know and rely on the love God has for us. Then he says, God is love. Love is the most talked about attribute of God, and it's probably one of the most misunderstood all at the same time. John says here that God is love. He doesn't say love is God, and there is a big difference. This doesn't mean, God's love doesn't mean that I can do anything I want to do because He loves me. What it means is that God wants what's best for you. And as you enter into that relationship with Him, you understand that denying yourself maybe the pleasures of sin for a season 
really is going to give you the opportunity to have the best life ever. God wants what's best for you. And do you know that He is for you? He is. He's not against you. He's for you. If that's true, and I believe it is, then number one, why do so many people avoid God? I mean, if they truly believe that God loves us the way the Bible says so, then why wouldn't you want to spend time with Him? Why would you possibly want to avoid Him? Well, I believe the main reason so many people avoid God is simply because of fear. They're afraid of what might happen if they really give their life to God. I mean, they've heard all the stories. They've seen all these these people who, you know, have such a distorted picture of who Christ is. And so people are terrified. I mean, I've heard these, these things a thousand times. They're afraid of what might happen if they give their life to God, so they're hesitant. And they want to keep a safe distance from Him. I want to give you three of the most common fears that people have that cause them to want to avoid God. And again, I've heard these a thousand times. These are the reasons people don't want to know God anymore. And they may be reasons that you're still tripping over. They may be reasons that keep you in the back row instead of the front row. I've never seen anything like this. I mean, you go to a concert and people are fighting with each other to get in the front row. You come to church and, man, there's never anybody down front. But, you know, when you get excited about the Lord, there's something happens. It just starts pushing you forward. But people people get so caught up in these fears that they want to avoid God. The first one is I'm afraid that I'm going to have to give up my fun. I mean, that's what, that's what comes out of the mouth of most Christian people. You're going to have to give up this, and you're going to have to give up that, and people's like, wow, I don't know if I want to do that. In other words, to become a Christian, guess what? means the party's over, right? To be spiritual is to be miserable. People are very committed to having a good time these days, and we definitely don't want to give up our fun for faith. We turn on the TV, we log into our social media, and it tells us over and over again that we only get one shot at this life. And we all know that to be true. You really are only going to get one shot at this life. So you might as well make it count. And you should have as much fun along the way as you possibly can. Problem is, television and all those forms of social media, they have given us a particular image of fun that is often frustrated by our faith. I mean, you can sit here in your mind without ever saying a word, and you can already imagine whatever you call fun, whatever you describe as to be fun, you can almost in your mind realize, yeah, but my faith is always frustrating my fun. Let me give you an example. What sounds more like fun to you? Miller time or Sunday school? Yeah? Bible study or vacation on the beach? Sunday morning worship or a day on the lake fishing? Now, remember, the question was, What sounds more like fun to you? Not what's right or wrong. What sounds more like fun to you? Listen, it's hard to wrap your mind around this. It's hard to wrap your mind around this because the world has sold us a lie. A lie that says, if you buy our version of fun, you're going to be happy. Well, listen, I'm here to tell you that I have bought their version of fun many times. And I'm going to say, listen, they were absolutely right. They were. It was a lot of fun. I was really happy for a little while. But then the thrill wore off, so I bought somebody else's version of fun. And then it wore off, and they said, if you'll experience this particular event, visit this exotic place, do this or whatever it is, then you'll be happy. You'll have fun. 
The commercial that gets me the most is where these two guys, they're sitting out on the beach and they're drinking and they're saying to one another, man, life just doesn't get any better than this, does it? But the truth is, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, it really does get better. And the more you know God, the more you realize that all those other things, the things the world says will make you happy, they are really nothing more than artificial sweetener. And they don't last. You know that to be true. People are desperately looking for fun fixes all the time. It's what you call the law of diminishing returns. You spend more time, more money, and more energy, and you get less and less of a thrill. And you know you're there. You know you're there when you go around. I mean, you just spent all of this money. You loaded everybody up. You're in Disney. I mean, you got the Mickey Mouse hat on. You spent $10,000. You've got a room. You've got passes. And all the kids are sitting around on their phones. And you know you're there when you walk around and you're asking, are we having fun yet, fam? You got to ask? Listen, when, when people are really having fun, don't you know? Can't you see? But when you get to this point where you're searching for those fun fixes and it's not happening for you, you have to go around and ask, how's everybody doing? We having fun yet? So many people are looking for love in all the wrong places, but they're also looking for fun in all the wrong places. Think about this. And I hope nobody is messing around with this because this is so stupid. And you heard me say it. It is so stupid. But think about this. Think about a singles bar. Nobody here is stupid, so no, nobody here is going to the single bars. But think about those people that do. I mean, have you ever seen a more phony place in your life than a singles bar? I'm serious. Everybody's pretending like they're having a good time. I mean, where else in all of life do you walk up to a total stranger and offer to buy them something? I mean, hey, stranger, I've never met in my life. Can I buy you a drink? Man, that's a lot of fun, right? Seriously, when was the last time you walked up to someone at a department store and said, hey, good looking, can I buy you a toaster? I mean, you would never think of something like that. But that's fun, right? Listen, the way to fight fear is with facts. Look at what the facts says in 1 Timothy 6, 17. Teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God who richly gives us, listen to this, who richly gives us all we need. You ever heard this about God? He richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment? Is that the God you know, a God that wants you to have a good time? A God that wants to give you everything you need for your enjoyment? For your enjoyment. Listen, God wants you to have a good time. God wants you to enjoy the life that he's given you. He doesn't want to take your fun away from you. Did you know that Jesus spoke more about being happy than he did about heaven? Matthew eleven nineteen 19 says that Jesus came enjoying life. You know what real fun is? Real fun is going to bed tonight with a clear conscience. Real fun is is a happy and unified family. Real fun is laughing in church like you just did. Having friends who don't manipulate you. Real fun is enjoying the world that God has made us to live in. Fear number two. And I'm sure many of you are still tripping over this. Fear number two is I'm afraid I'll become a fanatic. We just talked about some of the fanatics asking Jesus, you know, questions. By what authority do you do this? Who said you can be like that? There are a lot of well-meaning, misguided people who tend to cause us to want to avoid God, and I mean avoid Him at all costs. And they do that because of their fanaticism. I mean, I wrote down some names of some of, the, some of the religious fanatics that I know that I've met. And you probably know these guys too. So if they happen to be here, I'm just going to ask you to be polite and do not look at them. Okay? 
In fact, just look the opposite direction. Let's start with Freddie the Pharisee. You guys have met Freddie, haven't you? You probably know these guys too. I mean, listen, when you think about Freddie the Pharisee, he's rigid, he's narrow-minded, and he's legalistic. And he has a rule, and I mean a rule for absolutely everything. His favorite word is don't. Listen, there are people that are so afraid they'll become like that if they become a Christian. You know how frustrated they were when Jesus said, listen, the only thing I want you to focus on, the greatest commandment that you can follow is love me with everything you got. Man, Freddie absolutely hates that because there's got to be more rules than that, right? Then, of course, there's little Miss Susie, self-righteous. She always has this holier-than-thou attitude and is always judgmental of others. You know what her favorite phrase is? Thank God I'm not like you. You know, people look at her and they wonder, if I become a Christian, if I get to know God, am I going to be like that, really? And what about good old Billy, you know, Bible thumper? You know Billy Bible Thumper, don't you? He's that obnoxious, overzealous crusader. I mean, the thing about good old Billy, though, is if it's alive, he's going to convert it. I mean, his favorite phrase is, turn or burn, baby. Turn or burn. And what about, you, you love this one, what about precious little Pauline praise hallelujah? I mean, this old gal can no longer speak without religious cliches. Everything is a miracle or the devil did it. Her favorite phrase, and she's got dozens of them, but her most favorite phrase is believe, receive, and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now we laugh at that, but I couldn't be more serious because lost people are terrified of these people. They're terrified. They're afraid that they'll turn out just like one of these people if they become a Christian. And a lot of Christians... A lot of Christians are even afraid that if they get to know God more, that that's what's going to happen to them. But the fact is, John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus says, I've come that you might have life, not religion, and have it to the fullest. Do you understand Jesus? Well, well, his, his harshest criticism, his harshest criticism went to religious fanatics. I mean, read Matthew 23. He couldn't stand these people. He said, you guys are a bunch of whitewashed tombs. In other words, there's no life in you. He said, you strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. He said, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you do, you make them twice as much a son of hell as you are. Listen, God doesn't want to make you some religious fanatic. He wants to make you a righteous saint. Fear number three, I'm going to lose my freedom. The moment I cash in my freedom, man, it's over with. The moment I say yes to Jesus, I'm going to lose my freedom. Listen, the world defines freedom as a life without any restraint, able to do anything I want to do, say anything I want to say, without anybody telling me yes or no. We have parents today who worry about the songs their kids are listening to, and you probably should be. But I'll tell you, the words to Frank, Frank Sinatra's song, My Way, are a whole lot worse than some of the songs your kids are listening to today. Frank Sinatra, or as many as you know, old blue eyes, he sang, I did it my way. Everybody got burned by me, but I did it my way. I left five marriages behind, but hey, I did it my way. Total selfishness. But I had my freedom, and I did it my way. Think about what all of our freedoms have given us. I mean, our sexual freedom has given us things like AIDS, social diseases, and millions and millions of abortions. And what about all those chemical freedoms we have? Listen, it's given us grade school addicts and the most chemically dependent society in the world. And guess what credit card freedom has given us? You guys know this, a lot of you do. 
it's given you 146 easy payments. That's what it's given you. Can I just tell you there is no such thing as an easy payment? Every one of them are hard. Especially when you're still paying for the fun that isn't fun anymore. Bottom line is you're not nearly as free as you think you are. The Bible teaches us that with every choice you make, there's consequences. And I have said many times, you're free to live any way you want to live. But once you make that choice, you are no longer free. What you sow, you will reap. But notice what Jesus says about what I call real freedom. In John 8, 36, he says, If the Son sets you free, you will be really free. Notice the word really. He's talking about real freedom, not phony freedom. Real freedom is freedom from guilt. It's freedom from worry and from bitterness, from the, the fear of death because I know that I'm going to heaven. Freedom to be who God has made me to be. I love this. It's free to quit pretending. That's real freedom. So how do you get rid of all of these fears? 1 John 4, 18 tells us that there is no fear in love. There's no fear, but perfect love drives out fear. In other words, the antidote to fear is to recognize how much God loves you. Because love and fear cannot exist in the same heart. When you realize how much God loves you, you're not going to have a fear of becoming a fanatic. That's not going to bother. It's never going to cross your mind. You're not going to have fear that God's going to take away your fun or your freedom or anything else. Remember what the very first words of Jesus was when he came out of that tomb on, on Easter Sunday? Very first words, don't be afraid. He said, I'm not coming to scare you, I'm coming to save you. I'm not coming to enslave you, I'm coming to set you free. We just need to realize how much God loves us. And can I tell you, the more you fall in love with him, the more you give him everything you got, the more you keep the main thing the main thing, the more you love him with all your heart, soul, and mind, the more you're going to understand his love for you. We just need to realize how much God loves us. God's not at all the way many people think he is. God's not interested in making people miserable. But he is interested in making your life manageable. To effectively to do that, to effectively do that, you need to realize, number two, how much God loves you. Paul says in Ephesians 3.18, may you have the power to understand, may you have the knowledge to know, may you have the power to understand as all God's people should. That means we all should know this. We should know how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. Those four dimensions to God's love here are amazing. Notice those four words, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep. These are four ways God's love grows for you. For example, number one, God's love is wide enough to include everyone. How many of you believe that? Let me see your hands. You understand this is what makes you matter than anything in life? It's the absolute gospel truth, but it'll make you mad as heck. Let me tell you what, listen, Psalm 145, 17 bears witness to this. It tells us that the Lord is loving toward all that he's made. John 3, 16 says God so loved the world. That's everybody. Listen, knowing the good news that God loves me is exciting. But there's a flip side to that coin. You know what it is? <laughs> he loves my enemies just as much as he loves me. Jesus loved the unlovable. And that's what got him in trouble with all those religious fanatics that we talked about. You know, he socialized with people that were unsociable. He cared for people you shouldn't be caring for. And folks that's, folks, that's what we struggle with too. You see, we want God to hate those people we hate. We want God to pour out his wrath on those people that have hurt us. You understand that everybody you meet this week, imagine this, every person you meet, whether you like them or not, every person you meet, God loves them. Doesn't that just make you mad to think, God, how can God possibly love this guy? 
He loves them, think about this, as unconditionally as he loves you. Folks, you matter to God. You really do. More than you ever can imagine. You matter to God. But so does all those people who rub you the wrong way. And because of that, many people avoid God. It's like, I don't understand how he can love this guy that just shot all these people in New York. How could he possibly love that kid? All the pain that he's inflicted on somebody else. How could God love Hitler? I mean, you can insert your own name in that blank. But it's when we get to that point that we really don't understand how much God loves us. Well, let me tell you the secret to real self-esteem. If you want to feel good about yourself, if you want confidence, you need to truly realize how much you matter to God. God loves you. But more than that, you know what else? God likes you. He really does. He likes you. And truth is, if he likes me and I like me, if you don't like me, I really don't care. I mean, seriously, if God likes me and he says he does, then who cares what anybody else thinks? Because God loves me. I don't have to prove my self-worth to anyone. And folks, that can be so liberating. I don't have to, to have any of those props anymore to feel good about myself. I don't have to have the, a certain kind of clothes to, to make me feel like I'm okay. I don't have to drive a certain kind of car to prop up my ego. God has looked at me, and you know what he said? That guy's okay. I like him. He made you, and he loves you. But you need to understand God's love is wide enough to include everyone. And then number two, God's love is long enough to last forever. Jeremiah 31.3, God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Psalm 89.2 says that God's love will last for all time. This is so different from the kind of love we have for one another, isn't it? I mean, human love, let's be honest, it just wears out. It wears out. That's why we have so many divorces. But I, listen, I know a lot of people who are not divorced, but they don't love each other anymore. I mean, there's a limit to our love. And I'll be honest, if you don't water it, you don't tend to it, I promise you it's going to dry up. That's why we have to go to God. That's why we have to trust Him, you know, to bring His love into our marriage. I don't know how marriages last without God's love in them. I mean, human love can wear out so fast. It can wear out so fast because it can be so easily hurt. It's unpredictable and it's unstable. But God's love never wears out. It's always predictable. It's always stable. God's love is patient. It's persistent and it's persevering. Isn't that good news? I mean, isn't it good news to know that God never gives up on you? I mean, no matter what you do, his love never gives up. It's wide enough to include everybody, and it's long enough to last forever. That means that God's going to love you on your good days, and he's going to love you on your bad days, because his love, listen to me, folks, it is not conditioned by your response. God's love is unearned, and it's undeserved. So why not just go ahead and accept that? And then love him with everything you have. Number three, God's love is high enough to be everywhere. In Romans 8, 39, Paul tells us, Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That means that there is no place you can go on this planet or beyond where God's love isn't. You'll never be separated from God's love. Nothing, you understand, nothing, no circumstance, no situation, no person or power can separate you from God's love because God's love is everywhere. Man, that ought to be an antidote for loneliness. You'll never be separated from God. Fact is, we lose loved ones all the time. If you're married, there's a good chance that one of you is going to die first. One of you is going to die first, and you're going to grieve over that. But if you're a Christian, you're never going to be lonely because God can always, you know, always be there for you. You can depend on that. 
He's not talking about religion. He's talking about a relationship to Jesus Christ, a relationship that is so real and personal that it can comfort you in those times. His love lasts forever, and it's everywhere. And finally, number four, God's love is deep enough to meet my needs. As I read Psalm 40, 11, and 12, see if you can just kind of insert yourself in there this morning. The psalmist says, O Lord, don't hold back your tender mercies from me. You can almost hear the pleading in his voice. Man, I need you right now. Don't hold back your tender mercies from me. My only hope is in your love and faithfulness. In other words, my hope isn't in me getting it right or figuring it out. My only hope is in your love and faithfulness. Otherwise, if you don't love me, if your love's not faithful, if I can't depend on it, otherwise I will perish. No hope. For problems far too big for me to solve are piled higher than my head. I can't even see beyond them right now. I see no way of escape. I see no way out. Then he says, meanwhile, in addition to all of those problems that seem to have overtaken me, meanwhile, my sins, too many to count, have all caught up with me, and I am ashamed to look up. In other words, I don't even have the confidence, God, to look you in the eye right now. I am such a mess. I'm overwhelmed by circumstances. My own sin has convicted my heart. I don't even feel like I can speak to you right now. My heart quails within me. In other words, I'm going under for the last time. I'm about to sink. Well, can I tell you, no matter what your problems are, God's love is deeper than them all. Some of you are in deep despair this morning. Some of you are in deep trouble this morning. Under deep stress, you've got deep problems, emotional problems, physical problems, financial problems. But you can trust that God's love is deeper still. It's deeper than all of those things. Corey Ten Boom and her sister Betsy were Christians who lived in the Netherlands. And during the the, the war, they hid Jews in their homes to protect them from the Nazis. And when they were discovered, not only did the the Jews get taken to concentration camps, but so did Corey and Betsy. And they spent their lives there during the war. And Corey was one who was able to come out alive, but Betsy was killed there. At one point in the movie, In the Hiding Place, when they had seen just one atrocity after another, Corey says to Betsy, this place is the pit of hell. And Betsy, the one who died, says something so remarkable. She says to her, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper. Can you imagine being in a place like that? That is abusing you, that you're watching them just take life and throw it away as as though it was trash? And you still have that kind of, of mindset? To me, her sister Betsy, that's someone who understood what it meant to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Because it was only then that she did she understand the true love of God, that God loves everybody. And as much as he loves me, he loves these people who are brutally killing others. There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper. Some of you in the last few weeks or maybe the last few months you've hit bottom. I mean, maybe financially you think I'm going broke or you've hit bottom emotionally or your marriage has hit bottom. You're having health problems. You're frustrated and you think I'm going under. I'm not going to make it. Well, can I tell you, when you finally hit bottom, listen to what God says in Deuteronomy 33, 27. When you hit bottom, the eternal God is your refuge And his everlasting arms are under you. Did you hear that? When you hit bottom, God is there to catch you. He's there to support you when you have nowhere else to go. When you look at these four phrases, know the height, the depth, the length, the width of God's love. 
What you really have, folks, are the four dimensions of the cross. You have height, you have depth, you have width, and you have length. You can't really talk about the love of God without talking about the cross. Because the ultimate demonstration of love is when somebody gives up their life for you. The Bible says, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. The Bible says in Romans 5, 8 that God demonstrated how much he really loves us by dying for us. Christ died for me and for you. That's the ultimate demonstration of love. You know what that means? You matter to God. You matter to God. He loves you so much it hurts. I know some of you are worried about becoming a fanatic. I was too. I don't want to be like any of those people. And maybe some of you are worried that you're going to lose your fun or your freedom. And I'm sure that some of you have felt the love of God in your past. And, you know, a time when you were a whole lot closer than you are right now. You felt his love. You felt his concern. But you know that you kind of drifted away because you didn't want to be like that. But now you're wondering, Pastor, can I ever get back to that kind of relationship with God? Well, you know what God has to say to you this morning? Regardless of your situation, regardless of your background, I brought you here this morning to say one thing to you. Now, you already know he's talking to you. I brought you here this morning to say one thing to you. With my deep, unconditional love, I would take you back in a second. All you have to do is ask. I want you to know, I brought you here this morning because I want you to know, I'll take you back in a second with my unconditional love. That's what I want to say to you. God says, you matter to me. You matter to me more than you'll ever know. And I have a plan for your life. And your problems, your frustrations that you walked in here with, all that stress that you're experiencing... It's all there because you're out of my plan. You're not walking with me. I want you to get in touch with me. Build a relationship, not a religion. Get to know me. Let me show you why I made you. And he says, you'll find your niche and all of a sudden you'll know why you're here on earth. You're not here just to take up space, breathe, and die. God says you're here for a reason. As I close this morning, can I tell you, Because God is sovereign, He has the right, you know, to call the shots in your life. You wouldn't even be here, you know, if it weren't for Him. If you're not letting Him do that, you're living in rebellion, and that's why you're so frustrated. The most intelligent, rational decision you could ever make is to say, God, you are sovereign. And I want to cooperate with that. I recognize that you have a right to call the shots in my life, and I want to cooperate with that. Folks, if you do, you'll find so much fulfillment, so much meaning and purpose, so much satisfaction. You'll find your niche, and all of a sudden, you know, you'll find, this is why I was created. This is why I'm here. When you cooperate with the plan of God instead of fighting it, God's going to bless your life in some of the most incredible ways. Can I encourage you as I close this morning? For God's sake, don't reject His love for you. There is no one who will ever love you more than He does. Would you stand with me this morning? God, these last several weeks, as we've talked about getting to know you more I pray that the hearts of many of your people have been lifted up and there's been a a tremendous desire inside of us all to want to take that next step, to want to know you more. And God, I can't think of a better way to end this series than knowing how much you truly, truly love us. Your love is so unconditional. It's so unending. It's so high. It's so wide. It's so long and it's so deep. Help us to grasp that truth this morning and allow that to wash over us as we commit ourselves 
to keeping the main thing the main thing and loving you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. I'm going to ask our counselors to come this morning, and as they do with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, this is an amazing opportunity for you to come forward and experience that love we just talked about. If you're here and you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ and you know that you are not walking with Him the way you used to, there was a time when, when the relationship seemed to be so much stronger, so much more passionate than it is now. Would you come this morning and just say, God, I want to renew that relationship with you. Maybe you're that Christian that's here and, and, and just watch, man, I don't want to be a fanatic. I don't want to lose my fun or my freedom or any of these things. Could you find that? Can you find that conviction in your heart to just say to God, I surrender all to you. You are sovereign. Come this morning, just pray and say, God, you have the right to call the shots in my life. And I want to cooperate with that. As God gives you this time and this opportunity during this invitation, would you come?